All right, I already started broadcasting. We are live. We're alive. Hi, Brother Freeze and the rest of the class. <laughs> um, so I, my name is Angie Garris. I am the group leader for this week. And we're going to discuss the Mary Griffin at Derby Foods case study. And yeah, I have an agenda that we're going to follow, but we're going to start with a prayer. Does, do, you any, do any of you want to offer a prayer? I can say it. Perfect. Our dear Holy Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet today and grateful that we'll be going to school and to have the opportunity to further our education. We're grateful for this group and please bless our efforts as we meet that we'll be able to get done all that we need to in this hour and that we'll be able to be successful in our coursework. Please bless our families that as we are in school that they will be uh, blessed with what they need and that we can carry the burdens that are placed on our shoulders. We're grateful for the gospel and for the, the blessings that we have from that knowledge. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Julie. Yeah, in the agenda, uh, Brother Fritz wants us to start with a prayer. I don't know if next time we should do it before we start recording, but this time <laughs> we start with a prayer <laughs> in the yeah, video. I think that's what it said. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot. Okay, so do you guys read the case study? Yep. And I was going to say, good job remembering the prayer. I probably wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, so, I don't know, just a synopsis of the case, which is like, I don't know, somebody wants to tell us what they, I don't know, just a summary of the case. I could do that. So, <clears throat> Mary Griffin is vice president at Derby Foods, um, and, oh, what's his name? John, oh, I think John, that's... John, yeah. Shelburne, that's right, John Shelburne comes to her with a problem regarding uh, Simon York, saying that Simon, the new, a new brand manager, is uh, causing problems on production uh, just because there was an error uh, regarding the, the, the image of the brand for the Winter X Games. And so because of this error, Simon stomped down to uh, production and gladly, I guess you could say, tore everybody a new one. Um, and because of that, John Shelburne didn't like how Simon York was talking to his people, and so he went ahead and told Mary Griffin. Well, Mary knows the issue roughly and, and uh, knows Simon, knows John, um, but it sounds like that Simon is unaware of the problems he is causing. So with the meeting between Mary and Simon, Mary's got in the plan to kind of address the issue and, and try to coach and, and correct Simon. While well, Simon thinks this is an opportunity to talk about the status of the brand and how to go over the problem. So, yeah. And just to add up, I think um, Simon was a great employee. He was actually working for the company before. And, you know, he took him to successful paths with marketing and all that stuff. Um, I personally think that he was unexperienced and when you become a leader I feel like it's not only about what you read that you have to apply it's more like the experience that you have to get because you face like different situations with people so it's you know you don't you don't apply the same thing to everybody but and you obviously have to get to know the culture of the company which you know it'll give you like like a guideline in how you have to ma manage the team and all those things. But yeah, what you were saying, Zach, about, um, you know, uh, Simon York, he, he's, it says in the, in the reading that he noticed a slight imperfection on the label. So it wasn't that big. And he says that he went to the production floor and yelled <laughs> at the staff for producing an inferior product. He yeah. said that the production staff was running he said that the production staff was running a potential long-term partnership. That's why he was like really worried. But I don't think yelling, going to the production floor and yelling at the staff was the right thing to do because he had just started in that position. And people, honestly, I feel like groups of people like that don't take a new leader that easy. Does that make sense? 
I feel like, I don't know, it's hard to listen to someone. You have to get to know him. You have to trust them. And I don't know. But that's one of the things. And so, yeah, Mary Griffin, she, yeah, John went to Mary Griffin and told her about this stuff. And then Mary Griffin, when they went to the um, meeting and with Simon, um, I think he was um, doing us, he was presenting something and he found like another mistake in the slides. He didn't create the slides, he was another employee, but he, um, he actually said, York apologized to the meeting attendant saying, there is no excuse for this error. That's kind of harsh, especially for whoever created the slides. We all make mistakes. And then it says that Tim Durham, which is the guy that prepared the slides, he turned red and it was just, and he had to apologize in front of everybody. And Simon said, if the representatives from the X Games were here, this would be definitely be a career limiting move. So he literally, put um, Tim Durham down, I feel, and it wasn't the right thing. So, but yeah, just well, as I, I thought it was interesting, it did mention how he behaved prior, and it said that, you know, he was working with a boss that had been there a long time, but he convinced him to take new ideas and new approaches, and it said that he did it in a respectful way, but just kind of playfully challenged him, and so I thought, well, so he did know how to interact with people in difficult situations. So what changed just because he became a manager? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. But I, I feel like when you go to a management position, I mean, well, he, he had a boss. He wasn't the boss. So obviously he was able to, you know, speak for himself and everything. But now that he was a leader, it's like he had a certain style that wasn't like fitting the, you know, the team of the company. And, and yeah, I think I think that he's feeling the pressure of being a manager and his perfectionism, his his standards for perfection. He wants to do a good job for the client because it talked about him wanting to. Um, what did it say that he's really? Um, he brought this client on and he wanted to do a good job for them. So he's got this really high level of expectation for himself and for his team. And now he's feeling the pressure of being the manager. He's got to do a good job. And he's doing it in such a way that, that I don't think he realizes it's making people feel bad. His team's not going to work for him if he continues to, to do that. Yeah. You know? But I think it's out of this desire to, to be successful that he suddenly feels the pressure of being in a management position. Exactly. And I don't know if you guys remember the reading from last week from the book, Speed of Trust. Um, it says that it talked some, it talked about interpersonal skills that ma a manager should have. And I feel like he lacks of that right now, but he's a great employee or and he's going to be a great manager because his intentions are awesome and he tries to get his way and I feel like his way is pretty good it's just the way he's trying to um, do it is just he needs to learn about that but he's a good employee <laughs> yeah, according to the reading um, it's one of the four the four core competencies that was talked about capabilities I think is one of them as far as his execution and trying to correct errors and when errors happen how to appropriately address them without demeaning or demoralizing those who are responsible. Sure, if there's an error, you have to you have to kind of find the source of the problem. You have to address it so it doesn't perpetuate. But you've got to have the skills to know when, how, what strategies or tactics to use. And so as a manager, as a person, I would agree with you that he has the potential because of, of what he's done before and where he's at now and what he's taking on. He just needs to have the uh, the capabilities and the skills to be able to handle the things that go awry. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, we have a synopsis of the case. Now let's move on to, you know, the case facts we which we already talked about and the roots of the issue. So 
what do you guys think are the roots of the issue here? Well, I think we kind of addressed it. It's, it's, I don't think John Shelburne, the production manager is completely guilt free. Um, you know, even though he kind of comes in the case as a victim, given what's happened recently, um, I think maybe if he had the skills and the capabilities necessary, he might have directly wanted to work with Simon York and talking about because he's the production manager, those are his people. And so in a sense, as a manager, he could approach Simon and say, hey, you know, and address what happened there instead of taking his problem and dumping it on the vice president and making Mary Griffin feel like it's now her problem and then she has to deal with Simon York and then she might have to mediate a conflict between Simon and John. And so I think in my, from my understanding, the, the core issues is, is John's inability to manage you know, conflicts and things like that within his department. And then also another issue is, is Simon York and his inability to, to handle issues and problems appropriately. Okay, yeah, I totally agree. I feel like one of the roots, it's the lack of trust um, from York's team. You know, they don't, York's team don't trust them. That trust hasn't been established yet. So I think that's why John went somewhere else but he wasn't even cooperating in establishing trust or a relationship. So that, that, I feel like that's one of them. And then you said something else. Um, could we say like interpersonal skills? <laughs> yeah, like we yeah. talked about capabilities. Yeah. The lack of skills and inappropriately handling uh, issues and problems when they come. That's true. I agree. I think that John Shelbourne, you know, could have handled that in a managerial to managerial position, like, hey, come into my office, let's talk about it, you know, see what we can do, you know, don't yell at my staff kind of a talk, <laughs> rather than having to take it to Mary. Um, ideally, that would be, you know, the ideal thing. And then if it, if there's a problem from there, then he could go to Mary. But, you know, I think that's definitely a better way in the world to handle it rather than just mm -hmm. to go to who is above you because that's just that's yeah. hard on the person above you too yeah so exactly all managers you know all people really you know from our first case we read need to have those interpersonal skills to be able to talk conflict with somebody else yeah i was reading i'm actually taking com 450 right now which is communicate is negotiation and conflict management strategies in the book, we're talking about different ways that people manage conflict, and um, one of those ways is avoidance. You know, if you were taught, if you were brought up and, and taught as a kid, if you don't have anything nice, don't say anything at all, or anything like that, where you were kind of taught to, if there's conflict, just walk away kind of a thing. Perhaps John's issues don't stem just from what we see in the case necessarily, but could be something that he just he practices. Maybe he's he avoids conflict maybe and the way he avoids it is he just tells the person above and expects them to take care of it rather than taking care of it himself yeah i'm totally one of those people <laughs> <laughs> i'm like no no conflict that's bad <laughs> yeah I think we i'm are. learning i have yeah. a i posted on the discussion board i actually have a meeting at one with some people and i know there's going to be conflict and it's kept me up for two nights I'm like <laughs> terrified of this problem because I know what I have to say is going to be in conflict with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so I've been just been thinking like, how do I establish the trust? How do I go in with the right words to say, you know, that, that can have healthy conflict, you know? Exactly. And I feel like, well, yeah, there was conflict when, yeah, when York went to Mary, um no, yeah when john went to mary they um i feel like mary didn't want to do anything at that point because she knew that york was a good person a good worker you know but then another issue came you know in that uh, corporation meeting i think he was or something and then she actually noticed that he was lacking of interpersonal skills and that that is an issue um inside the company because 
you don't know how, you know, the staff, the employees, you don't know how they are going to react to that. They can be resentful. Um, they're going to have team behavior towards York, like really bad. And they are not going to create internal relationships. So she sees the necessity to talk to uh, to York at that point because, you know, it happened again. I feel it happens once. It's like, okay, you know, it happened once. But she saw another issue. So I think it's important to address the problem. And, yeah. Yeah, when it starts to be a pattern of behavior, then it has to be dealt with if it's not just a one-time thing. Exactly. But, yeah. So if you – I don't know if you guys have gone through – you know the lessons but each week our teacher gives us kind of like an agenda to guide our thoughts pretty much for this meeting and yeah so next meeting whoever is the leader check out the agenda it gives you a lot of questions and how to talk about this so yeah i'm using that I I, it was, sorry i thought it was interesting that we have um york's thoughts at the end like a real right. manager wouldn't really have that going in. <laughs> but because that would make me way more afraid if I knew he wasn't even expecting anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I thought that kind of changed the case study for me, you know, knowing where he was going in. I thought that was interesting. I know it's my first case study, so I thought that was just a little strange. Have you guys had other experiences where they kind of give you everybody's point of view? Yeah. Um uh actually in b380 that we had to we had a lot of case studies and they're oh, pretty lengthy but class. we had uh, yeah <laughs> tell me about it um and there are a lot of case studies where we got to, to understand the the perspectives from all sides and i think that allows us to not assume that we know what the other side is or what what their perspective is and they're trying to teach us that hey when there is conflict in the real world you will not know and so don't assume, you know, because as I think naturally for myself, as I'd read a case study, I see one person's perspective about a situation. And so then I kind of already have an idea or I conjure up a solution according to what I know. And then they throw in the other person's like perspective and thoughts. And I'm like, okay, how I would have approached this is totally wrong because I was totally wrong about the other person, the other situation, you know, Correct. So it's, I'd be right in the real world. We will never know exactly what the other side's thinking and what their thoughts and, and perspective is. But, and there are many cultures, so that's another right. crazy right. thing. So it's, it's, I think it's just a matter of teaching us and preparing us to handle situations like this without ever assuming or ever or trying to, to, to think we know everything about it, but to kind of appropriately handle it with an open mind. Yeah, that's that's what we what we read in Speed of Trust and the the section on listening that you know it's so important to listen first and rather than <coughs> assume that we know what people are thinking but to listen and then deal with the issues. Yeah. Correct. So, um I was pretty intrigued by JJ's comment. Uh you said that when in the reading, you see York's thoughts before he's going in for, you know, that meeting with uh, Mary Griffin. He's just thinking about, you know, great stuff. He doesn't even know that he's going to get um, chewed out because of that. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen one more time. And I want to show you something from the slides that we had. And, and yeah, that like changes the perspective of the case because first it was about, you know, the the problems that York was causing to the company. But now Mary Griffin has got to talk to him. She's got to be sensitive about it. So now how is she going to talk to him? So I feel like this is where we apply management skills, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so can you guys see this picture here where the underlying yeah. uh -huh. skills? OK. First of all, it says observation. She noticed, she paid careful attention to the behavior and she saw it twice. And then I'm sure she was already, uh, I'm sure Mary Griffin was already aware of the uh, impact that the behavior of York was gonna have in the company because employees were already embarrassed and mad 
and you know and then the next part it says interpersonal interaction which is delivered feedback in a way that can be heard and here self-management says be aware of how providing feedback impacts one's own emotional state so honestly york is going with a really cheer up emotional state into that meeting so she's gonna take that into account you know you don't when you're excited and you're gonna you're gonna go and tell someone that you're excited about something you don't want to like you know be told negative things that that doesn't go well i think so yeah. as a manager it's hard to deal with those things you you just have to see a lot of things it's crazy <laughs> With that, you, the, the thought came to my mind as you were speaking, um, Angie, that in that same slide, it talks about that we need to describe the behavior, not the person. Exactly. So at the same time, he can keep, we can maintain his, his drive and his tenacity and his passion with, and, and at the same time address the issues that we've observed without talking about him as a person and essentially kind of beating him down. And so we talk about what he has done and, and that, that and how that makes Mary feel, how that makes John feel, how that makes his teammates feel, without necessarily saying that, hey, Simon, you're a, you're crazy. You need to tone it back some, you know? Yeah. You say, hey, Simon, um, I think your tenacity, or I don't even know that's how to do it. So I don't even know how to how to do this stuff. In my mind, I'm like, oh, I got this, but I don't know how to actually practice it. <laughs> yeah. It make any sense? So I mean, you wish know, you talked about how. Uh, was it Tom or Tim in, in, the, pre in the presentation yeah. meeting, how he demeaned him, you know, in front of the board? And Chica said, how you demeaned Tom made me feel uncomfortable and made Tom feel uncomfortable as he turned red or something like that, you know? He might not have been aware. And I think that's what it is sometimes, is people just don't know that the behaviors that they exhibit cause, cause harm or, or cause conflict. Exactly. So. So when I thought Angie made an interesting point, you know, the first thing we do is listen and that takes some part of that is also observing like he's york's going to come into this meeting like excited right he yeah. has all these ideas he's going to bring and so that energy is going to be like conflicting with mary in my mind anyway she's afraid because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure right <laughs> so you know there's going to be that difference like as a manager if it was you would you be okay just to give him the floor for the first little while if you sense that enthusiasm from him would you say hey i can sense that you have something you're excited about talking about do you want to go first you know do you think that that would be wise or do you think like you'd be like no i'm just gonna get this over with because then he's gonna be deflated i you know in some sense hopefully not Hopefully the manager handles it well enough that he walks away feeling like that was a productive thing, <laughs> but it may not happen. We may not get around to his ideas and, you know, you hate to lose those as a manager. Exactly. What do you guys think? Um, let's, hear, let's hear Jay, Julie talk. I haven't heard her talk in a little bit. <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting that the self-management was something I hadn't thought about before because even, Julie, when you were saying how you've been up for two nights, you're worried about the conflict that you have to bring up to this class later today. Well, how we approach things and our fears and, and you know, if you're a manager, how you, your emotions about it are important. And so you have to be able to self-manage those in order to make positive you know, impacts with whoever you have to deal, you know, give feedback to. And so it, it's interesting to think about, you know, do you let, do you let Simon come in and talk about his positive things and then bring in the negative and give him the feedback that he has to have? You know, <laughs> and how does your emotions about that affect how you deliver that? And so that was something I just had never thought about that, you know, you have a part to play in it as a manager with your own emotions. Yeah. Okay. Now I have a question for each one of you. Um, if you were Mary Griffin, how would you start this conversation or this meeting with York? Well, I guess I guess I'll go first. Um, you know, Julie brought up a good point. Do you let York talk about what he wants to talk about and then you know destroy it? Then again, you probably I mean 
hopefully you don't because given you know, what we're taught you can still preserve that without having to destroy it necessarily but would it be better to address the conflict and the issues first and then perhaps give york a chance to talk afterwards you know at the same time and it could go either way for me though just i guess my preference on, on situations like this i would prefer to be direct about the issues because i called him into the meeting you know i didn't call him in the meeting so he could talk about what he's doing i called him in with a specific purpose and i think it would do him uh, it wouldn't do him justice to let him go on about what he thinks this meeting is about and then they say well actually there's something else i wanted to talk to you about <laughs> yes true so i would i would be direct like it says in the slides uh, be direct and address the that person you know to the person and talk about the behaviors and things that were discussed and how we can improve those or, or handle it differently um i think for me it's for me it, talking about the behaviors not the person would be my biggest struggle and and working on the behaviors and the the, the effects they have and then after that um you know, maybe if, if he's open to it, if he's like, he seems like a, an open guy, tenacious guy, so he might be open to some coaching, you know, exactly. so perhaps re, replaying the situations that Mary observed, replaying the situation on the production plan and, and, and work through some scenarios with him, um, showing my confidence in him and, and how we would rather have handled the situation should he, had, should he get a second chance or should something else happen. And then let him have a chance to talk about what he wanted to talk about also you know I there, like are that. People, there are people afterwards you know you can't you can't expect to just spill your agenda and then say have a nice day you know <laughs> so that's <fine. laughs> cool that's that's what i would do julie do you want to go next um i was just trying to find i wrote it down like exactly what i would say if i was mary as part of my practice but now i can't find it anywhere <laughs> <laughs> it's okay like literally that's what I would do if I was married. <laughs> I would write it down and be like, maybe that's what I should do for my meeting today. <laughs> uh, sorry, can't find it. But I it was just something the really going along the being direct again and just saying, I've noticed that, you know, there's some challenges with your team in the way that your behavior it also pointed out that, you know, I, I love that he's not treating his peers this way. So Again, it brings me back to that idea that I don't think this necessarily is an interpersonal problem. Like, I don't think he's one of those people that just can't relate with others because he has and he still is. It's really just his team that is having a problem or people that he feels are subordinates to him, like the production team. So, you know, I, I really think it's just a pride problem most likely. And so that's often a difficult thing to make people see. Um, I'm taking a theater class right now. And that's like, everybody's like, that's the theme of the thing is pride. And I'm like, no, that's just everybody's fatal flaw. <laughs> that's, just, <laughs> that's true. Every single play, that's the fatal flaw of both the protagonist and the antagonist. And so I think that the hard part of being a manager with dealing with interpersonal is when that pride issue comes in how do you help them to see that they're having a pride issue because oftentimes that's the hardest thing for a person to see exactly. um, and so being direct about that the behavior that you see in the way he's treating his employees is different than the way he's treating his peers exactly and that you'd like to help that situation be better so that his team can be productive. I like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I like that. I wrote it out much better. Sorry. It, it's a hard situation, <laughs> man. So no worries. All right, Julie. Well, I think when we when if she were to frame everything and you know, if you if you find out how he thinks things are going, maybe he doesn't even realize that what he's doing is so I don't think so. Is creating problems. And so if they find out if he can express what it tells us that he's thinking here that he wants to ensure that the production team delivers on the promises of quality and precision. Well, isn't that everybody's goal? Right. So it's all positive. Like the, the, the outcome, like everybody wants the same outcome. They want to have, you know, high standards and, and quality and precision in what they're doing. So if she can help him see how what he's doing is affecting his team and isn't going to meet that goal, then she can 
you know, encourage him in new behaviors to learn how to better manage the team and, and manage other employees so they can meet that goal because that, you know, he, he wants good things. It's yeah. not like he's just a jerk that wants to be a jerk. Right. I don't think that's what's going on. I think he just doesn't know how to go about or doesn't realize that what he's doing is going against what he really wants. Right. Exactly. Well, and I thought of some questions that she could ask, you know, saying like, why do you think your team's not meeting up to the standards that you have for them? Or how are you communicating with your team versus how you're communicating with others in the company? You know, how, how do you feel your team's reacting to your leadership? What things are different in your department now that you're the leader? Like kind of asking those kinds of questions really you know, gives him the time to be introspective rather than her necessarily like pointing out continually his negative yeah. behavior. Let I really him like that. On his own. Yeah, uh, I really. Although that I, may be my avoidance of conflict again. So you know, it's actually. I feel like when they tell you what to do, I am the type of person that doesn't like to be told what to do. But when someone helps you judge yourself, you know, and not feel like you're being judged. I feel like you are more likely to make those changes in a way, in a not prideful way. I don't know if that makes sense. But um, so is our meeting supposed to be one hour? You said as long as he's, I thought he said it could be 45 minutes to an hour. And so if we've done our stuff till then, I think we could, we could cut it short. Yeah. He doesn't want us to just air. <laughs> Fill, the, fill it with just a bunch of hot air just so we could fill the time. I think he wants it to be good, but we don't want to, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, just to start wrapping it up, uh, what I would do if I were Mary Griffin, I feel like I'm a really nice person and I totally see the potential that York has. And he, we need him in the company because he knows how to work. He still doesn't know how to be a leader, but he's learning. And as a manager, I feel like we have to recognize that and give people chances, chances. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. So if I were Mary Griffin, I will start with positive feedback about the things that he has done. I will not let him talk at first because I <laughs> scheduled the meeting, you know. And if he starts talking about his projects, an hour is going to go away and then we're not going to get to the point and then it's going to be deflating for him. So I would just uh, sit down and tell him like the things that he's doing good. And then I will, I, I, I'm pretty, I will use um, JJ's um, strategy of asking him questions and tell him that there are some concerns among the company in how his behavior is going to um, impact the company and I feel like after you know if, after Mary Griffin like ask these questions and York is able to evaluate himself she is going to be able to offer some coaching you know so that's my opinion and and I think we're good I think we covered this case pretty good and if you guys want to move on to the last comments um, that will be great of what you've learned throughout the week I mean not only about the case but we learn things that we can apply in the case. I don't know, just comments if you guys have some. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you can you repeat what it is? Just more like, I don't know, just the last comments if you guys want to come in on something or. Oh, on the case study is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we one thing we didn't mention that I thought was interesting is the, and this would go in the kind of the managers practicing before giving feedback, but um, being prepared for York's rebuttals because he's he's going to have some you know defensive mechanism somewhere inside of him that's going to say but or well you know, um, and so I thought that was an interesting part of the feedback and coaching, just to think about you know where where could he feel like I'm not justified, you know where could I need to make my argument you know, give it a little beef or have an example, you know, just that preparation. I think a lot of managers just go into like, I got to get this over with. And um, I've actually been reading the five dysfunctions of a team and it calls it interpersonal. Oh, I wish I could remember the word. I'd have to go look it up. Um, but it's really 
and it I'm like oh that just describes how a manager and it just says everybody fails that like everybody every manager is going to have um that oh no I have to go and talk to somebody and I thought oh good it's just not me like that I may be a little more timid than most people but um <laughs> I think that you know there there is some apprehension as a manager when you do have to have conflict with somebody, especially in this sort of a setting where it's in you know involving another department and your team and um, and so being prepared like that was what stood out to me the most was like going in prepared and having some ideas like what might he say and what might he think about that feedback and like just doing the time that it takes to plan and be well prepared, not just to feel like you're right, but be prepared to be able to say, oh, I, I value that opinion. I can see where you would feel that way. You know, that just that preparation would make the feedback and coaching go so much more smoothly. Yeah, so sometimes, we as, sometimes we assume what we're going to see or find, or we can say, oh, I'm just gonna coach him. But sometimes the meeting goes, different way so i like that preparation and be ready for yeah. whatever there with that i don't know the same class i love my calm 450 class right now it's it's great we love i don't know if you read this book leadership and self-deception getting in the box mm -hmm. oh it's a good book um but there's, it's a concept and i'm not going to talk about it because i'm going to botch it um <laughs> but essentially the meat of the book is that we all have um, we all can put ourselves in this box and what this box does, it actually, it distorts our view of ourselves and of reality because we choose to, or to not do something. And so again, that's way too brief for what the concept is. Um, but taking, I guess, applying that into Mary Griffin's case, she needs to remember that that uh, Simon is a person with good intentions, you know, with with strong feelings and opinions and things that are that he holds close to him with them and emotions and stuff like that. So with whatever he comes up <laughs> with, we can't think, well, that's stupid. Like, yeah, you know, you, you can't make him feel like he doesn't have a right to have his his own investment of emotions and feelings towards something. And so it's important to not disregard what he says as little of no value or unimportant. You know, great point. To, to be considerate and to recognize, hey, look, I know your intentions are good. I think we all have good intentions. I don't think one of us intends to be hateful and spiteful and have malice. So, you know, we have to recognize that his intents are good. His reasons are probably good and, and just on that as well. But again, we're not talking about him as a person and, and what his intents are. We're just talking about the behaviors and how he's trying to. Exactly. Nothing personal. <laughs> exactly. It's not personal and it's not trying to change who he is. It's just. We're just trying to help each other behave more appropriately. <laughs> Correct. Well, and I love that part when it said, view this as helping him over this hill so that he, how will this help us on the next hill? And I love that vision. Like, it's not about right now because we often get caught up in, it's about right now, but it's about helping things go better in the future. And I think that perspective would help Mary too. Yeah, definitely. Zach, what was the name of that book that you just Leader, mentioned? Uh, Leadership and Self-Deception. Thanks. You betcha. I, I, I have a digital copy for the class. I'm sure you probably could find something on Amazon. Sure. Um, dirt cheap, so. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's awesome, guys. Um, we're preparing ourselves to be leaders and deal with conflict. I hope this helps you, Yuli, Julie. Me too. Um, <laughs> in your discussion board. I know it's hard. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like you guys' input. It, I really like discussing stuff like this with people because, you know, uh, I feel like we think better. I learn more, and it's just pretty cool. But I think we're good to finish this meeting unless someone has something to say. We're just going to plan on meeting Fridays at 1030 then, right? Yeah. Are we good doing that? Works yeah. For me. Yeah, it works for me too. Okay. Great. Okay. So should I stop broadcast? Because I have a question about where to post this afterwards. Oh, um, really briefly. I think once you finish this, 
once you like stop the recording, it'll like post to your YouTube account or whatever. And then there's yeah. a link that you can copy from that video and just post into the discussion board. Okay. And so then you can watch your video through the link through YouTube. And it'll be only the link. Yeah, only the link. Yeah, I've done that before. Okay, cool. Then we can, we can all go. Thank you guys. Have a great weekend and I'll see you next week. Thanks. We'll see you guys. Bye, Take guys. care. Bye-bye.